the Spiritual Combat, and a treatise on the peace of the soul. Chapter 1. Preliminary Words on Perfection In what does Christian perfection consist? We must fight in order to attain it, the four things necessary for this combat. Christian soul, if you seek to reach the loftiest peak of perfection and to unite yourself so intimately with God that you become one in spirit with Him, you must first know the true nature and perfection of spirituality in order to succeed in the most sublime undertaking that can be expressed or imagined. Some who judge only by appearances make it consist in penances, in hair shirts, austerities of the flesh, vigils, fasting, and similar bodily mortifications. Others, particularly women, fancy themselves extremely virtuous when they indulge in long vocal prayers, hear several masses, spend many hours in church, and frequently receive communion. Others, and this does not exclude some of the religious who have consecrated themselves to God, think that perfection consists in perfect attendance in choir, in observing silence and retirement, and in a strict observance of their rule. Consequently, different people place perfection in different practices. It is certain that they all equally deceive themselves. Since exterior works are nothing more than dispositions for achieving true piety, or the effects of real piety, it cannot be said that Christian perfection and true piety consist in them. They are without doubt powerful means for becoming truly perfect and truly holy. When used with discretion, they are of unique value in supporting our nature, which is always indifferent to good and inclined to evil, in repelling the attacks and escaping the snares of our common enemy, in obtaining from the Father of mercies those helps that are so necessary for the faithful, and especially for beginners. They are, moreover, precious fruits of the consummate virtue achieved in truly holy persons. Such men chastise their bodies either in punishment for past offenses or for greater humiliations and subjection to their Creator. They seek solitude and observe silence that, withdrawn from the world, they may preserve themselves free from the least stain of sin and speak only with heaven and its angels. Their time is spent in works of piety and in the service of God. They pray and meditate on the life and passion of our Redeemer, not through curiosity, nor for the sake of some sensible pleasure arising from this, but from a desire of knowing better, on one hand, the grandeur of the divine goodness, and on the other hand, the depth of their own ingratitude. They do this in order to increase their love of God, and detestation of self, to follow their Lord in shouldering his cross, and in renouncing their own will. They receive the sacraments for no other reason than the honor of God, a closer union with him, and greater security from the power of the devil. The situation is much different with those who ignorantly place their devotion in external acts, which frequently are the cause of their own downfall and are of deeper consequence than open crime. In themselves they are not evil, but only when wrongly applied. They are so attached to these acts that they utterly neglect to watch the inner movements of their hearts, but giving them free rein, they leave them prey to their own corruption and to the tricks of the devil. It is then that this destroyer, seeing them go astray, not only encourages them to go on their way, but fills their imagination with empty ideas, making them believe that they already taste the joys of paradise, the delights of the angels, and that they see God face to face. As decoys, he does not hesitate to suggest in their meditation sublime, surprising, and ravishing thoughts, so that forgetting the world and all earthly things, they are swept up in the third heaven. A very little reflection on their conduct discloses their error, and the great distance between them and that perfection of which we are now in search. 
In every circumstance, they love to be shown preference over others. They know no guide but their own private judgment, no rule but their own will. They are blind in their own affairs, ferret-eyed in regard to those of their neighbors, always ready to find fault. Touch the empty reputation they think they possess, and of which they are extremely jealous. Order them to stop some of the devotions to which they are accustomed. Their amazement and vexation can hardly be expressed. If God himself, in order to open their eyes and to show them the true path of perfection, should send them crosses, sickness, or severe persecutions, the surest trials of his servant's fidelity, which never happen unless by his plan and permission, then the degenerate condition of their heart is laid bare through their own extravagant pride. In all the events of this life, whether happy or not, they know nothing of a proper conformity to the will of God. They do not know how to yield to his almighty power, to submit to his judgments, which are as just as they are secret and impenetrable. They do not know how to imitate Christ crucified as he humbled himself before all men, nor do they know how to love their enemies as the instruments used by God's goodness to train them to self-denial and to help not only in their future salvation, but in a greater sanctification of their daily life. This is the very reason why they are in imminent danger of being lost. With eyes blinded by self-love, they examine themselves and their actions, which are not otherwise blameworthy, and they are inflated with vanity. They conclude that they are far advanced towards God, and they readily look down on their neighbor. In fact, their pride often will so increase their blindness that their conversion cannot be effected without a miracle of grace. Experience proves that acknowledged sinners are reformed with less difficulty than those who willfully hide themselves under the cloak of false virtue. From this, you can easily understand that the spiritual life does not consist in the practices enumerated above if they are considered only in their outward appearance. It actually consists in knowing the infinite greatness and goodness of God together with a true sense of our own weakness and tendency to evil, in loving God and hating ourselves, in humbling ourselves, not only before Him, but for His sake, before all men, in renouncing entirely our own will in order to follow His. It consists, finally, in doing all of this solely for the glory of His holy name, for only one purpose, to please Him, for only one motive, that He should be loved and served by all His creatures. These are the dictates of that law of love which the Holy Ghost has written on the hearts of the faithful. This is the way we must practice that self-denial so earnestly recommended by our Savior in the Gospel. This is that renders his yoke so sweet, his burden so light. In short, the perfect obedience that our divine Master has enjoined by word and example consists in this. Since, therefore, you seek the highest degree of perfection, you must wage continual warfare against yourself and employ your entire strength in demolishing each vicious inclination, however trivial. Consequently, in preparing for the combat, you must summon up all your resolution and courage. No one shall be rewarded with a crown who has not fought courageously. But remember that as no war can be carried on with greater fierceness, the forces no other than ourselves, being equal on both sides. So the victory, when gained, is most pleasing to God and most glorious to the conqueror. For whoever has the courage to conquer his passions, to subdue his appetites, and repulse even the least motions of his own will, performs an action more meritorious in the sight of God than if, without this, he should tear his flesh with the sharpest disciplines, fast, with greater austerity than the ancient fathers of the desert, or convert multitudes of sinners. It is true, considering things in themselves, that the conversion of a soul is, without doubt, infinitely more acceptable to the divine majesty than the mortification of a disorderly affection. Yet, 
every person in his own particular sphere should begin with what is immediately required of him. Now what God expects of us, above all else, is a serious application to conquering our passions, and this is more properly the accomplishment of our duty than if, with uncontrolled appetite, we should do him a greater service. Now that you know what Christian perfection is, and that, in order to attain it, you must resolve on a perpetual war with yourself, begin by providing yourself with four weapons, without which it is impossible to gain the victory in this spiritual combat. These four things are distrust of oneself, confidence in God, proper use of the faculties of body and mind, and the duty of prayer. With the help of God's grace, these will be treated clearly and concisely in the following chapters. Chapter 2. Concerning Distrust of Self Distrust of self is so absolutely requisite in the spiritual combat that without this virtue we cannot expect to defeat our weakest passions, much less gain a complete victory. This important truth should be deeply embedded in our hearts, for although in ourselves we are nothing, we are too apt to overestimate our own abilities and to conclude falsely that we are of some importance. This vice springs from the corruption of our nature. But the more natural a thing is, the more difficult it is to be discovered. But God, to whom nothing is secret, looks upon this with horror, because it is His will that we should be convinced we possess only that virtue and grace which comes from him alone, and that without him we are incapable of one meritorious thought. This distrust of our own strength is a gift from heaven, bestowed by God on those he loves. It is granted sometimes through his holy inspiration, sometimes through severe afflictions, or almost insurmountable temptations, and other ways which are unknown to us. Yet, he expects that we will do everything within our power to obtain it. And we certainly will obtain it if, with the grace of God, we seriously employ the following four means. First, we must meditate upon our own weakness. Consider that fact, that being nothing in ourselves, we cannot without divine assistance, accomplish the smallest good or advance the smallest step towards heaven. Second, we must beg of God with great humility and fervor this eminent virtue which must come from him alone. Let us begin by acknowledging not only that we do not possess it, but that of ourselves we are utterly incapable of acquiring it. Then let us cast ourselves at the feet of our Lord and earnestly beg him to grant our request. We must do this with firm confidence that we will be heard if we patiently await the effect of our prayer and persevere in it as long as it pleases divine providence. Third, we must gradually accustom ourselves to distrust our own strength, to dread the illusions of our own mind, the strong tendency of our nature to sin, and the overwhelming number of enemies that surround us, their subtlety, experience, and strength surpass ours, for they can transform themselves into angels of light and lie in ambush for us as we advance towards heaven. Fourth, as often as we commit a fault, we must examine ourselves in order to discover our vulnerable points. God permits us to fall only that we may gain a deeper insight into ourselves, that we may learn to despise ourselves as wretched creatures, and to desire honestly to be disregarded by others. Without this, we cannot hope to obtain a distrust of self, which is rooted in humility and the knowledge of our own weakness. Whoever seeks to approach the eternal truth and fountain of all light must know himself thoroughly. He must not imitate the pride of those who obtain no other knowledge 
than what their sins provide, and who begin to open their eyes only when they are plunged into some disgraceful and unforeseen debacle. This happens through God's permission that they may know their own weakness, and by sad experience, learn not to rely on their own strength. God seldom applies so severe a remedy against their presumption unless more proper means have failed. Briefly, he permits persons to sin more or less grievously in proportion to their pride, and if there were any as free from pride as the Blessed Virgin, I dare say they would never fall. As often as you commit a fault, therefore, immediately strive to probe your inner consciousness. Earnestly beg our Lord to enlighten you, that you may see yourself as you are in his sight, and presume no more on your strength. Otherwise, you will fall again into the same faults, or perhaps much greater ones, to the eternal ruin of your soul.